Welcome to Chapter 3 of Derivative Securities. My name is Kirby Arkundath. I have a PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I'm a chartered financial analyst and a certified financial planner. I currently work as a portfolio analyst and retirement strategist and also an adjunct professor of accounting and financial management. In today's video, we will cover Chapter 3, Hedging Strategies Using Futures, out of the excellent text by John C. Hall, Options, Futures, and Other Derivatives. There are two different types of hedges you can use using futures, a long hedge and a short hedge. A long hedge is appropriate when you are going to buy some product at some time in the future and you want to lock in the purchase price. A short hedge is appropriate when you're going to sell a product at some time in the future and want to lock in a sale price. Examples of entities that would use a long hedge, a trucking company or an airline that wants to lock in long term the purchase price for its fuel to lower the risk of that price going up, um, and a steakhouse that wants to lock in a purchase price for cattle are perhaps also in the agricultural center a baking company that wants to liken the purchase price for grain. The countersides of these on the short side would be oil companies that want to lock in the sale price for their oil, uh, farmers that want to lock in the sale price for their cattle or their sale price for their grain that they are producing. And in this case, both entities would be lowering their risk, both the long and the short side, because they now know long into the future what the purchase price will be for some of their input products or the sale price will be for the items they are producing. Arguments in favor of hedging are generally related to a company should focus on the main business they are in and take steps to eliminate outside risk. So if you are an internationally operating company and you produce a product, pretty much any product that you sell in another country, you don't want to have to worry about exchange rates all the time. So you would sign contracts that would lock in the exchange rate between, for example, the euro or the dollar or the won or the dollar long term, and that you don't have to worry about those things fluctuating. Just like a farmer perhaps would lock in a sale price for his grain, and you could have banks lock in interest rates that it's going to cost them to loan money in the future. So all these would be ways of lowering risk for these companies, and then they would concentrate on what they would consider their, poor, their core process um, of the business, producing loans, uh, selling oil, whatever the, the actual product is. Arguments against hedging. Well, most investors and companies can be well diversified. They can buy index funds, mutual funds. They can invest easily in thousands of different companies. So what do they care about the risk of an individual company? And generally, they shouldn't. And while hedging can lower risk, it is an insurance product. All insurance products cost money. So overall, on average, they would slightly lower the profitability of a company over time. There are also some situations where engaging in hedging could actually increase your risk relative to your competitors. For example, um, Southwest Airlines has done a good job in the past of going long oil futures, locking in prices, and then they have been able to be more competitive versus other companies if oil prices go up. Well, let's say the opposite takes place and Southwest locks in oil prices and prices go down then the other airlines can purchase oil at a lower price than Southwest could, they could lower their ticket prices, and they could outcompete Southwest. There is also the final problem listed at the bottom here that most people in organizations don't know much about derivatives, they haven't taken a class like this, and if you as a chief financial officer in a company engage in a hedge and it actually moves against you, then they would accuse you of speculating and losing money with the derivative, and you could try to imply, no, this is an insurance product, I'm doing it to lower risk, but that might not go over too well with the CEO. It might not go over with the other management or with the shareholders in the company. One of the risks you will engage in when 
um, creating a hedge is basis risk, and it's usually defined as the spot price minus the futures price. And it's going to arise because of the uncertainty about the basis when the hedge is closed out. So commonly, if you do a hedge involving a futures contract, you will not be able to get a futures contract on exactly the product you want expiring on exactly the date you want, which will create this basis risk. We show here a long hedge for the purchase of an asset. Um, if we just purchased it on the day we wanted it, we would pay S2, the asset price at the time of purchase. Well, let's say we sign a futures contract for a hedge ahead of time, and then what we would have is F1, the futures price at the time the hedge is set up. This is the contract we sign it for. On the day of expiration, we have the futures price at the time the asset is purchased, F2. If um, the future expired on the exact day that uh, we wanted to engage in the purchase, F2 would be S2, but that isn't always the case. So if we look down here at net amount paid, well, if our future expired on exactly the day that we wanted to engage in the purchase, F2 would equal S2, and this would cancel out, and we would pay F1, what we signed for the contract. But since that isn't always going to be the case, in reality, we will pay F1 plus the basis, and the basis is, again, the, distant, the difference between S2, the actual purchase price of the contract, and F2, the um, value or the price of the future on the day of expiration. We can look at the same sort of equation for a short hedge when we are wanting to sell a product in the future. And again, the price of the asset when we are going to sell it will be S2. Um, the day we sign the short hedge for sale, um, F2 will be the future price at the time the hedge is set up. F2 will be the future price at the time the asset is sold. And S2 is, again, the asset price at the day of sale. B2 is going to be the basis of the day of sale. So we sign a contract for F1. If we could actually sign a futures contract on the exact product we want expiring the day we want to engage in the purchase, then F2 and S2 will be the same thing and they will cancel out in our lower equation and we will pay F1 the future price we signed the contract for. Generally that's not the case, so we will pay F1 plus the difference S2 minus F2 since we probably cannot close out our contract exactly on the day we want to purchase the product. Choice of contract. Well, you can't always, again, get a contract on the exact product you want to buy, so you have to find one that is closely correlated. Um, if you want to hedge on the U.S. dollar versus, let's say, the Polish zloty, the currency of Poland, well, there probably isn't a very liquid contract on the Polish zloty, but it trades pretty well correlated with the euro, so you might choose to hedge on the dollar versus the euro. So you're going to want to choose a delivery month that is as close as possible to, but later than, otherwise your insurance expires before your hedge expires, the end of life of the hedge. Uh, when there is no future contract on the asset being hedged, choose the contract whose futures price is most highly correlated with the asset. That is known as a cross hedge. And how do you create the optimal cross hedge? Well, we look at an equation like this, and we say the proportion of the exposure that should optimally be hedged is H star, where rho down here is the coefficient of correlation between change in S and change in F. Um, delta S is the standard deviation of delta S, the change in the spot price during the hedging period, whereas delta F is the standard deviation of change in F, the change in the future spot price during the hedging process. So this would be the number of contracts optimally you would want to hedge. As a mathematical example, we will look at this. An airline will purchase 2 million gallons of jet fuel in one month and hedges using heating oil futures because there isn't a very liquid and good contract on actual jet fuel. 
from an historical perspective, the standard deviation of the future is 0.0313, the standard deviation of the spot is 0.0263, and the correlation coefficient is quite high at 0.928. So the number of contracts you're going to want to hedge is 0.928 times the ratio of 0.0263 divided by 0.0313, which gives us 0.78. So our actual hedge would look like this. The size of one heating oil contract is for 42,000 gallons of heating oil. So you divide by it and you purchase 0.78 times the 2 million gallons that you want to hedge divided by 42,000 gallons per contract, which means you will sign a contract for hedging 37 futures on heating oil. An alternative definition of the optimal hedge ratio is shown here. H hat equals rho hat, standard deviation S hat, standard, divided by standard deviation of F hat. And the difference is now the correlation coefficient here is the correlation between the percentage daily changes for the spot in the futures, whereas earlier it was a correlation between the dollar daily changes for the spot in the futures. The standard deviation hat of S now is the standard deviation of the percent daily changes in spot versus dollar change in spot. And standard deviation of F hat is the standard deviation of percent daily changes in futures versus earlier when it was dollar change in futures. The reason for doing this is shown here. Let's say we are engaged in a cross hedge, for example, the jet fuel hedge using heating oil contracts discussed earlier. Well, the optimal number of contracts um, is going to be this equation here, which we can adjust for daily settlement. So initially, it's going to be our initial definition of H star times big QA over big QF where big QA is the size of position being hedged in units, and big QF is the size of one futures contract in units. We could rewrite this for the optimal number of contracts after tailing adjustment to allow for daily settlement of futures as our H hat that we defined in the last slide times big VA, which is the value of position being hedged, the spot price times QA, divided by big VF, the value of one futures contract being hedged, which is the future sprite price times QF. Now this we can adjust on a daily basis, and the reason we're going to do that is the price, our value of the jet fuel that we're going to want to hedge is going to change on a daily basis, and the value of the heating oil is going to change on a daily basis, and these two are not going to change exactly in tandem. So as the marking to market process occurs in the futures market, as a result of that, we're going to want to change the optimal number of contracts at least slightly on a daily basis or maybe on a weekly basis throughout the life of our hedge. Another type of hedging we might want to engage in is hedging using index futures to hedge out the value of a stock portfolio. Let's say you have a million dollar portfolio and you are worried about the stock market dropping. You might want to at least temporarily hedge out that risk. To do that, to hedge the risk in a portfolio, the number of contracts that should be shorted, taking a short position, is going to be this, where you might use something like the S&P 500 futures. So VA is the value of your portfolio, say a million dollars. Beta is going to be measured as the covariance between your portfolio and the S&P 500 divided by the variance of the S&P 500. And VF is the value of one futures contract. As an example, we would say if the S&P 500 futures price is 1,000, it's quite a bit above that now, and the value of your portfolio is 5 million, 
let's say you have a relatively high risk portfolio of 1.5, then you could calculate using the previous equation the position in futures contracts on the S&P 500 necessary to hedge your portfolio. We will show the solutions to these type of examples or at least similar ones in separate videos. You could also ask the question, what if I don't want to completely hedge out my position but just reduce my risk? You could ask what position is necessary to reduce the beta of the portfolio 0.75? Or what if you want to increase the risk of your portfolio if you think the market's going to go up a lot? You could also ask what position is necessary to increase the beta of the portfolio to two. And again, we will have separate videos that will explore solutions to these problems that you can work on between now and the time period those videos are watched. Why would you hedge equity returns like this? Well, again, you may want to be out of the market for a while if you think we're, for example, in a, another version of the dot-com bubble, which is certainly possible here at the end of 2021. And hedging would avoid the cost of selling and repurchasing the portfolio and also avoid a lot of things like capital gains taxes. Um, you could also look at questions of suppose stocks in your portfolio have an average beta of one, but you feel they have been chosen well and will outperform the market. Maybe you just want to, rather than taking on stock market risk, just want to take on the risk of your ability to choose stocks better than the stock market. Then hedging could ensure that the return you earn is risk-free um, rate of return plus the excess return on your portfolio over the market. This would be something similar to what a hedge fund would do. Try and eliminate market risk and just make returns risk-free above market risk. If we engage in futures hedging, our trade in futures contracts, we may want to keep those positions longer than the expiration time period for a standard future. Um, one way of doing this is so-called stack and roll. We can roll futures contracts forward to hedge futures exposures. Initially, we would enter into a futures contract on hedge exposure up to a certain time horizon, maybe a year. And just before maturity, we close out that contract and replace them with a new longer term contract. This is not without risk. There can be liquidity issues. In any hedging situation, there's a danger that losses will be realized on the hedge while the gains on the underlying exposure are unrealized. You get a marking to market process each day. You may have to pay in more money to cover that margin. And of course, as you change from one contract to another, there is going to be volatility issues and that margin that you have to pay could get much larger. A very bad example of this is the German company Mattel Gesellschaft, which sold long-term fixed price contracts on heating oil, a range of about five to 10 years at a little bit above the price of heating oil at the time. And they hedged those out with their own um, short-term contracts in the futures market. So they had very long-term contracts they signed with other people, hedged with short-term contracts. What happened is the price of oil fell. So presumably then, their very long-term contracts should have gone up in value a lot, and over time they would make money off these other organizations being uh, forced through the contract to pay them a much higher heating oil price than the market price. But while those were long-term contracts where they would get paid sometime in the distant future, the own uh, hedging out in the short-term futures contract were market-to-market -market daily. So they had to come up with a large amount of cash to pay the short-term contracts now, and they wouldn't make the profits from the long-term contracts until later. Uh, the company ended up not being able to, or at least not choosing to, keep these contracts throughout their lifetime and instead closed out the contracts and made a loss of around $1.3 billion. Their counterparty with the long-term contracts was okay getting out of this because then they wouldn't have to pay the higher price for the long-term heating oil. But it ended up to be a major loss for Metallica Southshift. I thank you. 
for watching this video.